You know, as Daddy just said, and Brother Howard, from the time I was a little boy, people kept telling me that I should be in the ministry. I knew that that was his greatest desire for me. And every time I came home, Brother Howard would mention it to me as well. But if I, had, if, I had, if, I had, if I had decided, all right, I'm going to go in the ministry at that time, you know what? I would have been doing it for their approval. And I went, and I tasted of some of the pleasures that life has to offer. I had husks with the pigs. And finally, I came back because my daddy brought me back. Amen. I'm not here. Because I think I should be in the ministry as a matter of tradition or because I believe that there's some benefit. I'm here because he showed me that no matter how far I went, he refused to let me go. Amen. And because of that, how can I neglect so great a salvation? Amen. The reason I've decided to do this is because that he has told me that this is what he wants me to do and I only desire to serve him from this day forth. Amen. So that is why I'm here. And I am blessed by the occasion. So I always have a sense of a little sadness when camp is coming to an end, you know. Everybody is going back to where they came from, especially our overseas visitors. We develop a connection with each other. And I felt a little pang this morning when I saw Brother Gregory leaving. Tomorrow, we break camp. We'll have to say goodbye to Sister Dai soon, Sister Kathy, Sister Pat, and Donovan, I wish I could take Donovan's energy with me anywhere I go. I felt sad thinking about it. But you know, I encourage myself because I know that very soon a time is coming when all of us will be in the same place. And I will see all of you all the time. We will never have to part again. So I look forward to that day. And these occasions only help to increase that desire. While I feel sad, there's an occasion to rejoice though because today our kingdom and our army just got a little bit bigger. Just got a little bit bigger. I no longer say the army of heaven. It's our army. We are a part of it and it is our job to help to build that army. And I feel proud that our family has gotten a little bit bigger today. I know the devil will be coming. He's not a happy camper today. He'll be coming and he'll be coming with all guns blazing. What greater is he that is in me? than he that is in the world. Right. None can pluck us out of his hand. Unfortunately, I have fallen into the lunchtime slot again. And uh, I'm going to ask you to take a few deep breaths. If you're hungry, just draw your belt tight for a few minutes. I'll try not to be long. I'll just invite the Lord's presence with us before I begin. So just bow your heads. Father, I thank you for the way in which you have blessed us thus far throughout this camp meeting. You have revealed yourself to us. May the blessings continue today. And may we all live here having seen much more of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so what I'm going to do today, I'm not going to try to preach a sermon. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm talking with the intention of reaching the younger people because... As I said, in the lunchtime period, I know it can be difficult to concentrate when you're hungry and sleepy. I'm going to entitle my presentation, The God of Pariahs. The God of Pariahs. Now, does anybody in here know what the caste system in India is? If you know what it is, just raise your hand. All right. The caste system in India, it's a, it's a, it's a system of segregation where you have pe the people are divided into groups, Right? Hinduism is the largest religion in India. And so they have some people who are at the top, and they call those the Brahmins. The Brahmins are the richest people in India. They live in a society that is cut off from the rest of India. They are the most respected people. They have the biggest jobs. And how are you a Brahmin? If your mother is a Brahmin, your parents are Brahmins, you are born a Brahmin. They are the ones who become priests and teachers in the society, right? Next on the hierarchy is the, the Kshatriyas. They are, born, they are the ones who are the warriors and the rulers. Third, we have the Vaishyas. They are the farmers and the traders and the merchants. 
And then finally you have the Shudras. They are the ones who do tasks like laborers and, and, and mixing concrete and things like that. Now the thing about this caste system is that it's complete discrimination. If I am a Brahmin, I can't get married to Sister Tracy, who is a, a Dalit. Right? They don't interact or mingle. In fact, the Brahmins can't even say good morning to somebody who is in a lower caste than they are. You can't even say good morning. If you have a tank that you drink from, not, you can't share the same tank or well. You cannot eat in the same place. In fact, each of them have barriers that separate their community. And a, a, a Dalit cannot go over the barrier into a, a, a Brahmin territory. So it's complete and total segregation. And I, I was surprised to find that in this modern day and age, you have that kind of system existing. But there's a group of people that they don't even have on the list. They have no caste, right? They are at the bottom of the list. They are called pariahs. And who are the pariahs? They are the ones who clean garbage. They are the ones who scrub toilets. They consider the pariahs to be lower than dogs. If a Brahmin passes, if, he, if he's coming down the street and, and he sees a pariah, he will step off the road for the pariah to pass. He's not supposed to pass him on the road at the same time. Right? You cannot say good morning to him. He's lower than a dog. Now, in our society, we don't have a caste system explicitly. But, you know, if you think about it, we still have caste in our society. Our society judges you by the amount of money you have, your educational status. Some of them judge you by your race. And the big shots and the money people don't really interact with the little small ghetto people. Right? If you go to some places, in fact, you have what we call the VIP section. What does VIP stand for? Very important person. And what makes you very important? How much money you have. You can pay to sit over there and the poor people can't afford it. So that makes them more important than you. Same thing in the airplanes. You have first class and then you have the little common people sitting in coach. What makes you qualified to sit in first class? The money that you have. So even though we don't have an explicit caste system in our society, it's there underlying, on, on the tones of it are there, right? One of the things I despise about politics and politicians is that politicians don't mingle with common people. They get into power, they, when, they, when they want to get into power, they come to the smallest little man and they promise him all kinds of things and then they get into power and for five years you don't see them. And then when it's election time again, oh, they're back down there with the, the small people, right? Right. But other than that, their interaction is with their big friends and Jacket and tie bodies. So, as I said, it exists in our society, even not, though not as explicitly as, as, as the, the Indians. In the days of Jesus, there was a very distinct caste system as well. Right? The Jews were the people of God. But they knew it, and trust me, they rubbed it in the faces of everybody, every chance they got. As far as the Jews were concerned, every other nation that existed around were dogs and scoundrels and pigs. In fact, even today, the Jews believe that. If you listen to an, a, a Jew being interviewed and ask his opinion about Jamaicans or Americans, when you hear them talk about those people as if they are less than animals, that's the concept they had of themselves then. The phrase, their favorite phrase was, we are Abraham's seed. One time they had the temerity to say to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. We are Abraham's seed. What they were saying to him is that you don't even know who your daddy is. But we know where we come from because, you know, Jesus' father, it was, he wasn't, everybody knew that Joseph wasn't Jesus' real father. So they were trying to throw that in his face to say that you were born of fornication. We are of pure blood. We are direct descendants of Abraham. They believed that they were better than other nations. But inside, within their society, they had castes as well. Because you had the top of the line, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. 
and they didn't mingle at all with the publicans and the sinners. Now, there's a popular saying which we all know. Birds of a feather do what? Birds of a feather flock together. A man is known by what? The company he keeps. Show me your friend and what? I'll tell you who you are. I grew up hearing these things, especially from my mother. So I was very careful not to keep bad company growing up. I mean, how would it look if you passed me, Brother Donovan? You passed me night after night standing at the bar with, with a prostitute. You would start to wonder and think, this doesn't look right. A man is known by the company he keeps. So, the question I want to ask you today and what I want you to focus on while I try to hurry. What kind of company does God keep? If a man is known by the company he keeps, what kind of company does God keep? Well, if you ask the Jew that, he would tell you, God only associates himself with righteous, upright, top-of-the-line people. To this day, that's what they believe. In fact, there's a verse in Habakkuk which would seem to suggest that this is true. In Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, it says of God, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour, devour the man that is more righteous than he. What this verse is saying is that God cannot look at anything that is evil. He, he cannot look at anything that involves iniquity. And the Jews believed that God only keeps friends with righteous, holy people. And of course, who was that? They believed it was them. But if you truly want to know the kind of company God keeps, let me ask somebody this who is under 20. If you want to know what kind of company God keeps, this question is for somebody under 20. What, where would you have to look? All right, Luke says the disciples. That is correct, but there is a more accurate place than that. All right, somebody over 20 answered, but I'll take the answer just the same. You have to look at the only person who was the perfect representation of the Father. Who was that? The Bible says, of Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He's, the Bible says that he was the express image of the Father. If Jesus sneezed, and wiped it with a piece of tissue. That's exactly what God the Father would have done. Right? If Jesus liked to dance and clap his hands, that's exactly what God the Father would have done. Jesus was the express image of the Father. And so if you want to know the kind of company that the Father keeps, look at his perfect representative on earth. Men create castes in their minds, even if you don't do it consciously. It happens unconsciously. There's a guy who, who lives in the community where I live. And man, every time I see him, I try to kind of hide my face or turn away. Because as soon as he sees me, he has a, he has a very oily tongue. He says, what's up, pastor? He tries to call me by a name that he thinks will get me thinking positively about him. But he's a beggar. He, he only wants to beg me money. Right? And when he comes, from before he gets near, I can smell him. He's a very unkempt, unhygienic fellow. And he pesters me. Sometimes I go to, get up in the morning, I go outside. He's at the gate out there standing. Wait until I wake up. Out there waiting. Right? I go to Mandeville. If I see him, I have to try to kind of duck down. Because he constantly pesters me. He's just begging a drinks money. And this is... I can't help it. Sometimes I don't have a negative feeling when I see him because I know what he's coming for. Now, God keeps a certain kind of company. Look at the first thing that Jesus said. One of the first things he said when he started his ministry. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the to the poor. So the first thing that we see is that Jesus keeps company with poor people. Poor people. He had sent me to heal the broken hearted. Jesus keeps company with those who have a lot of stress and drama. People that we try to avoid and stay away from. He has sent me to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. He hangs around sickly people. People who are feeble and like to complain a lot. He hangs around those people. And to set at liberty them that are bruised. From the outset, Jesus declared something that was surprising. He said, I am come not to hang out with the big shots. This great Messiah that was promised all these ages ago. People thought that when he was coming, he would be this rich king who hangs out with the Sadducees and the scribes and the Pharisees and is in the top of higher echelons of society. Jesus shot them and he said, I am not come for those people. I am come to mingle and to mix up with the pariahs in society. The one who everybody else looked down on. In fact, when Jesus was choosing his friends, Four of the first people he chose. You remember what, what profession they had? Fishermen. fishermen. Now I would like to point out to you, Luki, that a fisherman has no bachelor's degree. He has no big bank account. He has no big house. Uh, the only thing that I can guarantee you about a fisherman is that for most of the day they stink. Uh, they are always interacting with fish. Jesus, they're raw. Jesus chose four of the lowest people in society. Outcasts. In, in there, there were the pariahs. And he said, listen, I'm going to make you my, four of my closest friends on this earth. Right? That was another sign of the kind of company that God keeps. And as I said, one of the reasons why the Jews could not accept Jesus was that he himself was from a little poor, one of the poorest towns in Israel. He came from Bethlehem in one of the, one, one time they saw him, they said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was like a ghetto, like, like Riverton in Kingston. It was notorious for producing scoundrels and worthless people. And that is where Jesus came from. And one of the reasons they could not accept him was because of the kinds of people that he continued to hang out with. Yes, yes, Brother David. Right, thank you. His father was a mere carpenter, right? His stepfather. And as I pointed out before, some of them were implying that he was born of fornication. So, the people that he hung out with caused a lot of questions to rise in the minds of many people. Many people would have followed Jesus, you know. Many of those same scribes and Pharisees would have followed Jesus, but they just could not accept the fact that he hung out with this kind of crowd. And they kept saying to himself, listen, birds of a feather flock together. If you hang out with a scoundrel and a brigand, what does that say about you? And they theorized and they mused in their big houses. And they refused to submit to their consciences. And that's one of the reasons they gave themselves. They told themselves. They justified it to themselves. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 29, we can see this idea being brought forth. It says, Levi made a great feast in his house and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. And hear what these people say now. The scribes and Pharisees, the Brahmins, the big shots, the ones with the money and the education and who thought they were better than everybody else. They murmured against the disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Why are you keeping such bad company? Why are you hanging out with this lowly crowd? They were questioning Jesus because of the kinds of low lives that he was hanging out with. Jesus' answer was very telling. He said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous. I didn't come to call those who think they are better than everybody else. I didn't come to interact with those who think their position and their material wealth and their social standing qualifies them to be my friends. I came to call sinners, the ones that everybody scorn and look down upon and demean and think are nothing. Those are the ones I came to call. He made it clear again. 
Now, with all of these points I'm making, I want you to remember that Jesus is a perfect reflection of who? He's a reflection of the Almighty God. This is saying that if the Almighty God had the ability to come to earth, he would first find the pariahs, the toilet cleaners, the garbage collectors, the ones who are out there lying in gutters. That's the, those are the people that God the Father would associate himself with if he were on earth instead of Jesus. I'll take it further than that. Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 13 and 14. It says, And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. Now, when I come to camp meeting, I look for people like Brother Arthur, Brother Wayne, Brother Jim, Brother Darren, people who are on my level, people who are in more in my age group that I can have a conversation with, with. I can shake their hands and I can interact with them. I don't go looking for Kelani and sit with her and say, tell me about your life. How are things going? Maybe if I did that with Vanessa, I would get a long story. But I don't go to Cade and say, let's discuss Revelation chapter 13. Tell me what you think the beast is. Because they are not at my level. You don't waste time interacting with the children. You see them and you, you, you pat them and you pass by. You interact with the adults because big people interact with big people. And worse if a big dignitary was here like the Prime Minister of Jamaica. Right? You are too important to find time for children. And it's not that we don't think they are important. It's just the natural way of things, right? These people brought their children to Jesus to bless them. And when it says children, it's not talking about Luke, you are what, 15? It's not talking about Luke's age who can have a decent conversation and interact with you. It says he brought, they brought young children. Young. So we're talking about maybe Cade and younger, Zane and, uh, Zane's age. And the disciples, like any of us would do, they said, listen, Jesus is busy. He has more important things to deal with. He has sick people to heal. He has sermons to prepare. You expect Jesus to find time for those little babies? You know what the Bible says when Jesus heard? You know what it says? It says not only that he was unhappy, he was much displeased. Much! He was upset because the God of heaven, the one who created the world in six days, wants to interact with little children like Kelani. The Bible says he took them up in his hands and he blessed them. He found time to stop what he was doing, stop all the important work, the preparation of sermons, the healing of the sick and the raising of the dead. He found time to stop all of that, to interact with children. Because he is the God of pariahs. Amazing. I'm hurrying along because I know you're tired and I don't want to keep you here long. I just want to make the point. Another set of people who were if, I mean, they were probably the lowest of the low in terms of pariahs in Israel. Were lepers. Right? In the time of Jesus, leprosy was the deadliest disease known to, known to mankind. It was, it was a disease that when you caught it, it was as a death sentence. It was sort of like what the medical world wants us to believe about cancer today. Once you get it, you are finished. It's just a time bomb waiting to explode. Leprosy was a horrible disease. I, 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 I pointed this out online. The, f the living flesh on your body started to rot while you were alive. You could stay anywhere in the room and smell the stench. Nobody wanted to be around you. In fact, according to the law of Moses, once you had this disease, you had to separate yourself from the congregation. You had to go and live in the bush like a dog. And if you needed to go into civilization, you had to walk and shout, Unclean! And once anybody heard that word, everybody knew what it was. That one word could clear this entire room within five seconds. Everybody would scatter once they heard that. Because nobody wanted to be, even to breathe in the ear that came from a leper. It was such a dreadful disease. And I pointed this out online again. I remember when, when the big C just came out, they, they had this advertisement where some people were standing in line at a bank. 
a long line extending all the way outside. And this man came and saw the line and he didn't want to join it. So he just went there and did like this. <coughs> and when he did that, within two seconds, everybody had scattered in all directions. And he just walked to the front and did his business. Leprosy was kind of like that. It was the fastest you could see old ladies with walking sticks move when they heard that word unclean. So, in Mark chapter 1, we see a story here that tells us again what kind of company God keeps. It says, there came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him. How? How did a leper get that close? When you look at how the disciples behaved, mothers were bringing children to, to Jesus and the, the mothers couldn't even get through because they were standing there like bodyguards deciding, okay, you can come, you turn back. They were like a hedge around him. How could a leper get so close to Jesus? You know why? When they saw him coming, you know what they did? They themselves scattered too. Everybody ran. Except Jesus. Right? The leper didn't need to go there. And <coughs> All he needed to do was to make himself be seen. And everybody scattered. And the Bible says he came kneeling down to Jesus and beseeching him. Now, I, I want to tell you something. When you are in a situation that is impossible, hopeless, nothing can help you, the best place to be is kneeling at the feet of Jesus. He came and he kneeled down in front of Jesus and the Bible says he beseeched him. You can see the desperation in his eyes. Everybody is taking up stones to stone him. Right? Nobody wants him around. Everybody is telling him, get out of here. Are you crazy? Are you insane? Everybody is despising him and rejecting him. He comes to Jesus. He sees none of them. He ignores He tunes them out completely. It's one thing he sees. And it's his only hope. The Bible says he comes and he kneels down and he beseeches him. Desperation in his eyes. His voice so weak he can hardly speak. If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. You know the best part about this story? Jesus doesn't say to him, Man, what are you doing? Don't you know that you, you are endangering all of these people here? Where's your mask? <laughs> Jesus doesn't say to him, Why are you so thoughtless? Why are you coming so close to me? Jesus, with the heart of God, looks at this man. And the Bible says his heart was moved with compassion. Not with scorn. He didn't cover his nose like some of us would do or turn his head away. His heart was moved with compassion. And then you know what he did? How can you not love this man? The Bible says he stretched forth his hand and touched him. What? Jesus could easily have said, be healed without touching him. And the disease would have disappeared immediately. Jesus could have said like he did to the ten lepers. He could have said, go and show yourself to the preach. He didn't have to touch him. Why do you think Jesus touched him? Why? You know why? Because the heart of God wanted to say to this man, I accept you. I don't scorn you. I accept you as a child. He put that hand there to, and that hand gave that man confidence for the rest of his life knowing I am accepted by God. He didn't just stand afar off and tell him what to do. He touched him with affection and with feeling. I'm coming to your sister Joan. And immediately, the man says, if you will, like, you can heal me. Jesus said, I will. Immediately. Amen. Be thou clean. This is the heart of God. A God who keeps company with pariahs. The worst people in society who everybody else rejects and condemns and want to have nothing to do with, he will take you. And he will make you clean. Amen. Sister Joan. You want to come? Uh, absolutely. I think maybe he had been watching Jesus from a distance and seeing the way he dealt with people. Plus, of course, he had heard stories about this man. Yeah. right? And he realized that this person will show me mercy. He went to him in complete faith. Risking his life, you know, because I'm telling you, when he approached Jesus, everybody was taking up stones to stone him from a distance. Right? 
It was a, it was, he risked his life to get that miracle. Right. So, I'm going to cut what I have to say short, but I'm hurrying along because I don't want to weary you. Here we see again the kind of company that God keeps in John chapter 8, verses 3 to 11. We have heard this story so many times, but it is so wonderful, it cannot be exhausted. It says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now let me point out something to you here now that I discovered which is interesting. One of the, one of the groups of people in, in, in the days of Jesus that was discriminated against and that was seen as nothing was women. Right? It had become such a male-dominated society that women were only seen as child bearers. According to the law of Moses, if a man and a woman were caught in adultery, you were supposed to stone them to death. But these men had manipulated and twisted the law to the extent that now only the woman was stoned to death. In addition to that, the man that she was caught with could help to stone her. But injustice. But this woman now is caught. She was caught. She couldn't say she wasn't doing it. She couldn't deny it because you know why? She was caught in the very act. I suppose somebody passed and saw her doing whatever she was doing and raised an alarm and before she knew what was happening, the crowd came. Dozens and dozens of sweaty, loud, arrogant, aggressive men burst in on her. They didn't give her a chance to fix her messy hair. Didn't allow her the dignity of putting on her clothes and dressing properly. They gripped her with their dirty, filthy fingernails sinking into her skin and they dragged her out into the street like a dog. Right? Making a whole scene. Alerting everybody to what was happening. And I can imagine that people were throwing open their windows when they heard the commotion. What's the problem? What did she do? And they were announcing it. Telling everybody. Right? People who had done the same thing just the night before. And worse were spitting and turning up their noses and saying how disgusting she was. Children were running out, watching the scene. And the poor woman was there in the middle. She knew that she was as good as dead. Nothing could save her. They dragged her through the streets and while they were walking with her, you know what they were doing? They were picking up rocks, preparing for the slaughter to come. Nobody gave her a chance. Nobody wanted to hear her side of the story. Nobody gave her, even gave her the opportunity to explain her side, right? All they knew was that they caught this woman sinning and she deserved to die. They dragged her through the street to Jesus. The Bible says they set her in the midst. It was like a court set up. Everybody was surrounding her. Everybody had, some people had two rocks. Some were piling up the rocks in front of them, waiting. And I always think about it, you know, how awful must it have been to be stoned to death? Stones smashing into your skull, breaking your nose. I mean, shattering your teeth. What an awful way to die. She was standing there and her heart was beating so fast she couldn't hear what they were saying because she was so terrified. Her life flashed before her eyes. She knew that she was hopeless. It was, it was, it was useless. And they brought her and they put her in front of this man. She was guilty. There was nothing she could say. Master, this woman was caught in the act. Moses said we should kill her. What do you say? Of course, Luke, they were just trying to trick Jesus. Because if Jesus said stone her to death, then some people would say how cruel Jesus was. If Jesus said don't stone her, then they would say that Jesus opposes Moses. An abomination in their eyes. So here was a dilemma. It seemed that nothing could save this woman. It was hopeless. But as I pointed out before, when you are in an impossible situation and nothing can help you, nobody can save you, it's useless in the presence of Jesus. At his mercy is the best place to be. And this is where this woman was, at his mercy. If anybody could do anything to save her, it was this person. The Bible says Jesus bent down and he started writing on the ground. What did he write? It doesn't say. But I assume that maybe he was writing some of the sins of the people. Maybe he wrote, stealing. And he looked at the people who he knew were thieves. The Bible says their conscience started to smite them. He looked at those people and those people dropped the rocks they had. 
And then he wrote, murder. And he looked at those people and they dropped the rocks that they had. He wrote adultery. <laughs> Maybe the most rocks fell when he wrote that. <laughs> one by one, those rocks fell. He didn't say a word. And the Bible said eventually, everybody left. And only Jesus remained. That is where our lives must come to. Only Jesus must remain. The woman could scarcely believe what was happening. Just a few seconds ago, she was on the verge of death. And now, where there was an almighty din and uproar, there was just perfect silence. And this man standing before her. And he looked at her. Where before she had seen scorn and disgust and murder and savagery. She saw nothing but eyes of love and compassion and mercy. Jesus said, where are your accusers? She said, she looked around. Nobody. You know the only person here who was fit to throw a stone? He who was without sin. Who was that? Jesus. He's the only one there who was worthy to stone that woman to death. But you know what he said instead? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin. No more. Wow. From certain death to peace and salvation. All because she had come to this man, this wonderful man who keeps friends with pariahs. And from that day forward, that woman was never the same again. She never did that dirty lifestyle again. She was changed because she came in the presence of Jesus. Now I have a few more stories to share, but I'm, I, one of the things I learned over the years of being a teacher is that you can't saturate your students and you have to look at the audience and know what, where they're at. And I know that people are hungry, hot, tired, sleepy, so I'm going to stop here. But I want you to take from what I said this morning. Those who were just baptized and those who... I know some of you were just rebaptizing, right? You understand the kind of master that we have. When everybody rejects you and looks down on you and turns their noses up at you, they judge you based on your educational standing, your financial situation, your race. There's somebody who will take you where you are. No matter what you have done, no matter how far you have gone, he will take you. And he doesn't care about any of that. All he wants to do is take you and put you on his chest, just like he did with one of those smelly fishermen. Put you on his bosom. And none shall be able to pluck you out of his hand. In the interest of your stomachs, I'll stop now. But I thank you for listening. You did great. You did well. And may we continue to see the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs>